Welcome to Backpacker Radio, presented by The Trek. I am your co-host, Zach Badger Davis. Sitting to my right is... I am Juliana Chauncey, a.k.a. Chauncey. Question of the day. What's something your parents used to tell you that you're now pretty sure is a lie? Yeah, I'm realizing with our Triple Crown coming up that this is a very parent-themed episode. Yeah, I don't know. Rachel must be getting reminiscent. She's getting married soon. Maybe she wants to be a parent. There you go. Um, Let's start that rumor. Anyway, um, <clears throat> something my parents used to tell me that I'm now pretty sure is a lie. This came up in our group chat the other day because Denver was getting like wild thunder and lightning. Um, and I work on a computer at home. And like when I grew up, we always were told, because my mom worked on computers, and we had like a little computer room, like an office with desktop computers. And we were always told by her that we had to shut the computers off when there was thunder and lightning because you could get electrocuted. And the only reason I believed it so strongly was because she would also turn off her computer. Mm. Um, And she works on a computer. So I can't imagine that was just her way of like hanging out. Yeah. Um, But it wasn't just to get us off. It was like, there's lightning, everyone off the computers. There's thunder, everyone off the computers, shut them down. Like don't even leave them running, shut them down. And when I was working the other day while there was lightning, I was like, isn't it weird that we're not being told to turn our computers off? Yeah. Did you look into that? Was there any truth to that back in the day? I feel like maybe... I have not done any research on this. I'm just starting to doubt based on observing my surroundings and how little other people care. Well, I don't think you'll have to because I'm sure we'll get an email on this in the next two weeks. It'll be from my mom. (laughs) Stop talking about me. (laughs) Uh, Mine's a little bit more philosophical than tactical like yours. And the lie that they told me was that I could be anything I wanted when I grow up. Hmm. Well, in principle, I think that's a, a generally a good message to give to your kids. Like, I'm not, there's no condition where I would have been playing in the NBA, which was kind of what I wanted my to do when I was a kid. So That was your sport of choice, was basketball? I grew up in the Michael Jordan era. So, hmm. yeah, I grew up obsessed with basketball. You did like that dancing movie. What was the dancing Michael Jordan one? Oh, The Last Dance? Yeah. <laughs> the dancing movie. <laughs> Still yeah. haven't watched. Yeah. That was a that dancing movie was very good. Do you have anything like more like fun? No. Like a better answer? No. That's oh, okay. that's the state of my days right now <laughs> as I'm going with the darkest possible answer. Cool, cool, yeah. cool, cool. So kids, if you're listening to this, you can be a lot of things, but not anything. You certainly can't be anything. You're yeah. gonna be limited by your genetics, your opportunities, and uh your your willpower, which is the one thing that's in your control. How are you gonna translate like this new learned message to your kids? Uh that they're probably not gonna be in the NBA. So I'm gonna let them know like on their third birthday, I'm going to sit them down and be like, you can be a lot of things. Here's the things that you can't be. I don't care what anyone tells you. You can't be this thing. Okay, cool. Yeah. Reminders of any kind? <clears throat> uh, no. We've got an awesome guest in the studio. I want to get right to that. She's returning. This is Renee Shira Patrick. She's a Triple Crown through hiker with over 20 years of experience planning hiking and improving long distance trails. She's an environmentalist and passionate outdoor enthusiast who believes that long distance hiking can deepen, deepen our relationships with the landscapes and environmental issues that desperately need more advocates. And if you want to hear <clears throat> Renee's first interview, go back to episode 44 back in 2019 when Chance was out gallivanting on the AT. Living a better life. Yeah. Uh, Renee, first and foremost, great to see you. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Excited to be back. So catch us up on the last f- four years, three years. Oh, man. Okay. So that was 2019, I think in years. Okay. What did I hike each year? Yeah. <laughs> uh, there was that little COVID thing that happened. Oh, that. Yeah. Oh, that. Well, I was fortunate enough to get out in the year of COVID. So 2020 um, actually helped ground truth a new long distance trail, the Blue Mountains Trail up in northeastern Oregon. So I hiked about 600 miles of what is now a 530 mile long distance trail um, to see what was on the ground. So the organizing group, the Greater Hells Canyon Council had drawn a line on the map and they needed someone to hike it. So I volunteered to go hike it. Hell yeah. Is this just pure route? Are there any trails involved? There's a lot of trails. So <clears throat> Northeastern Oregon, if for those of you not familiar, it has the Wallawa mountain range, the Strawberry mountain range, Elkhorn's a bunch of different mountains, but a lot of these trails have been neglected for who knows how long, decades, much like many of our trails across the country so a lot of the the task was finding out what still is on the ground so some of them have been affected by fire some just deferred maintenance um, beetle kill you name it flooding so there had been a massive flood in the umatilla watershed 
which had washed out a huge section of trail and so and road. So I was walking like in the stream bed because the road was just gone for this <laughs> section. So it was really a giant puzzle of what's here and if nothing's here, where would I go and where it would be good for folks to go until some of that can be remediated or opened up, that sort of thing. Yeah. So I'm not familiar with those mountain ranges at all. Give us the characteristics of that area. If somebody wanted to go hike it, what would it look like? Yeah. So the Wallau and the Elkhorn Mountains are an island of granite in the mm. volcanic um, geology of Oregon. So you have you know the Cascades. You all know the PCT. It's all volcanic rock. So you have these white marbly granite spires it's it's really reminiscent of you know a little bit of the sierra so high alpine lakes um high alpine vegetation and then um it also it goes along the hell's canyon so the snake river is uh below hell's canyon one of the deepest canyons in the country and so this route i say route because it's a mixture of of roads so a lot of you know some dirt roads um two track trails or old roads, which are now trails. A um, little bit of cross country to connect the dots. But yeah, you're walking above Hell's Canyon for almost 50 miles. And mm-hmm. then you drop in and out of these massive drainages um, and along some free, free flowing rivers, which are hard to find anymore. Everything is dammed. Mm-hmm. So um, the North Fork of the John Day River is free flowing, which has its own challenges. The Wanaha River free, free flowing. So floods every year so there's log jams and every year it looks different like where can i cross or how has the river changed and this year especially there high snow everywhere in in the west so um yeah it'll be a challenge it's like a new a new trail every year maybe yeah are you going to get involved because obviously you are the executive director at the oregon desert trail well, that has changed. So this year I left uh, the Oregon Natural Desert Association in my staff position to start my own long distance trail consulting company. But I am they are my first client. So I'm still managing the Oregon Desert Trail and helping hikers out and, you know, refining resources as needed. But it's on a very, you know, part time contract basis. So now my um, I can help other trails. So I've been very involved with the Blue Mountains Trail, sort of shared a lot of the resources that I had developed for the Oregon Desert Trail to model off of. And it's another conservation organization that wanted to create a trail to engage the recreation community in learning about the environment and learning about the landscapes. A lot of Northeastern Oregon is not well known. There's not a large population base, not even a ton of visitors. A few of those mountain ranges get a lot of visitors, but they really think to help people understand it, hike it, mm-hmm. you know, spend time in these places, s- walk along the, the Snake River, which is heavily dammed, and then a free flowing river. This organization is really looking to protect old growth trees. And so you walk next to these massive, beautiful old growth trees, and then you walk next to logged, heavy logged areas. And they really want to engage people in understanding the issues that are particular to that region. Mm. Um, So I really love, because the Oregon Desert Trail was really designed to engage people in understanding these issues. The Blue Mountains Trail is sort of taking that, that on. And now that's what I want to do for other trails is even if conservation isn't in the mission to understand that a lot of hikers want to understand what's happening, what's going on, because they're seeing these places being affected by different, you know, development or loss of biodiversity. Fire is a big one. Um, Yeah. So I think really we the time has come to engage hikers and give them an opportunity to get more active if they want to in environmental issues. Hmm. What kind of issues are occurring in that area? You mentioned specifically like issues that are local to that region. What are the ones that they want to be looking out for? Yeah, so the Snake River is a great one. There's been a movement for years to remove some of the dams because really the salmon runs are the lifeblood of that area. And it's shown like if salmon are running, that provides nutrients to the trees. The The area is more um, ec- ecologically diverse if, if the salmon come back. Um, beavers, another one. So beaver are a key indicator for the health of of some of these desert streams, because a lot of this area is still kind of high deserty. And so beaver and building their dams 
granted as a hiker sometimes it sucks to hike over a beaver dam and through the pools but they help retain water on the landscape and in these small creeks and tributaries which cools the water down and creates more habitat for the fish so um, when i was hiking there was actually a, a project to track signs of beaver if i found signs of beaver it was through a naturalist you know so folks can understand so the organization can understand where are the beaver Maybe they're coming back some places that they weren't aware of. And as hikers, we sometimes get into the nooks and crannies. And especially because I was trying to figure out what's there. Um, it was interesting. Unfortunately, I didn't find a lot of beaver activity, but I think that's a lot of it. I had my head down and, you know, bushwhacking and it was, uh, oh, I forgot to look for beaver today. <laughs> that sort of thing. I'm sure we could do an entire episode, a series of episodes dedicated just to the subject of starting, establishing, and growing a trail. But in your experience, what is the number one challenge associated with that process? Um, I think it's, it's sometimes the planning of it. So I really encourage the Greater Hills Canyon Council to think of the Blue Mountains Trail as a route instead of a trail they needed to build and then say that they had something. So a route, you can work on it over time and develop it as you go. And re originally this, this idea was formulated in the 60s. These two men that were local to the area wanted to create this more of a circular trail and have it be like a hut to hut type European backpacking experience. But they spent so much time trying to build it and establish it and go within, you know, the Forest Service and they need to do an environmental analysis. And sometimes that can take a decade mm -hmm. before you get out on the ground and build it. And so I said, what if you just identify what's here, connect it with some roads, little bits of cross country, call it a route, and then you can work slowly at if you want it to be all single track, you can build single track over time, but you don't need to wait until it's done to say we have a thing mm -hmm. that can be hiked. Because, you know, I've been hiking a lot of routes and I can tell you it's a relief to get to a road and hike a section of road after it's been a really challenging, you know, bushwhack or something like that, cross country section or trail with hundreds of down trees, fire damage, you can't tell where the trail is. Give me a little bit of road, that would sure. be a relief. <laughs> And that, I guess, raises the question, which I know we covered in the previous episode, but for people who are hearing this who haven't heard that episode, can you just quickly go over your trail slash route resume? Right. So again, let's think of years. So 21 years ago, I hiked the Appalachian Trail, 2002, no bow. Um, then I was living in England for grad school. I did the West Highland Way, a lot of small sections of like the North Downs Way, South Downs Way. Let's see, 2006, the Pacific Crest Trail, 2007, the Colorado Trail, 2008, the Northville Placid Trail, 2009, the Arizona Trail and the Wonderland Trail. Um, let's see, it might have been a dry spell because then I was on the CDT in 15, the Oregon Desert Trail 16. Uh, what else? I've done the Sunshine Coast Trail, that was 18 in British Columbia. Uh, parts of the Tahoe Rim Trail. I, lately, I haven't been finishing trails, which is a whole other thing. Like, so I've been section hiking, one thing or another, injury or whatever. Um, 2020 Blue Mountains Trail, 21. What did I do in 21? I can't remember 21. 22. Last year, I went back to the AT and hiked Sobo for a few months as my 20 year anniversary oh, nice. hike. So I went from Maine to Massachusetts, the hardest part. Um, and then this year, I hiked a route called the Columbia Plateau Route, which is a new route along the John Day River, another free flowing river that might potentially one day connect into the Oregon Desert Trail. <laughs> and that one I didn't complete either. I decided this is going too slowly uh, and it's part partially a pack rafting it's a multi-sport thing so on day three when i wasn't making the mileage i needed to and i was looking at uh having to ration my food i thought mm, i'll just get in my pack raft go back to the beginning and then go to the next section yeah well you've got enough miles under your belt that you don't need to prove anything <laughs> to anyone uh i don't no one blames you for not completing anything I'm curious to know, you said you did uh, a long section of the AT is like a 20 year anniversary. Do a retrospective, a comparison. What was it like being back 20 years later? I know quite a bit has changed. 
Well, what's changed is my memory. So <laughs> 20 years ago, I was 25. Um, and by the time I got up to New England, you know, you're just in the zone, um, hiking long, you know, 20 plus mile days. I didn't really remember it. It was a blur. What I remembered were the photos I took. But back in the day, I didn't have, there were no digital cameras. I had paper disposable cameras I would pick up in the gas stations. So I maybe have 100 photos from that entire five months. So I find if I don't have that to look back on, it's hard to remember. But there's certain places that I did, like, oh, that view. I remember that view. Um, but also going Sobo and starting with the hardest and not being in through hiking shape, it just felt like a totally different trail, to be honest. Mm. Um, but what was still there was the community, the hostels, the, the trail angels, just the passionate people. There's so much love for the AT out there. And it, it was wonderful to be part of that community. It was sad to like say goodbye to the Sobos that I had been with for two months. And then I just watched them on Instagram and YouTube finishing their hikes, yeah. but. What does it feel like to get, obviously going southbound is a totally different experience than going northbound, but it sounds like for a lot of your recent hikes, you've been on routes where I imagine you're either with a very small group or by yourself. What does it feel like to be back in a hiking community? I loved it. And that's something I had been missing. Like I, I love solo hiking and I love being out and knowing I'm the only human for miles. And that's been a lot of what I've done recently, but I'm one of the fav my favorite things about trails are the people, the community, the poop talk and the jokes and all of that. And so I was looking forward to that. I was looking also looking forward to hiking where I didn't have to look at maps and route find all the time where mm -hmm. I could just walk and not have to pay attention to know where I am and to find water and I didn't have to carry a lot of food or water it was just really wanted to get back to the trail experience yeah but it sounds like since the AT you've gone back to that route finding style hiking so obviously there's a major draw in it for you what is that I think it it's a puzzle to me routes or are it's up to you to define, you know, where you're going, how are you going to piece this together? And I thought of this analogy recently, hiking routes is like the parkour of the backpacking world. It's like, it's, there are really no rules. You decide where you want to go on this landscape and what is going to be fun, what is going to be quick, what is going to be, you know, maybe you want to throw in a pack raft or a bike or skis, you know, there are very few rules and it's up to you to sort of create your experience. Mm. And what I say, and I'm sure I mentioned this last time on the, on the Oregon Desert Trail, it's like, ch it is really a choose your own adventure. Like our lines and our waypoints are a suggestion of travel, but I encourage people to really play with it and understand that most of it is, if you're on public land, you can, go where you want to go mm -hmm. if you know if you know how to go yeah and how to read the map chauncey might have to finish this off here but we're already getting to that point in the show fuck mary kill so the two <laughs> items that i'm going to contribute here is you got trails you got routes and chance is going to give us the third option we have not touched on a third option you could go let's go with consulting <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay sure that's a good one <laughs> well consulting is so new so oh man let's see <laughs> I Give up your new dreams. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't kill the new dreams. <laughs> As so. Zach said, you can't be anything you want. So. <laughs> yeah, but right. I love trails so much. I don't want to, yeah, I would have to mm, kill routes, marry trails, fuck consultants. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I love it. We've asked this question before on a Far Enough Back episode that I don't remember what it was. But I think it can be very intimidating for someone who has only done trails to break into routes, especially if you are a solo hiker or if you hike with someone who also hasn't done a route before. Do you have suggestions for routes that would be approachable for someone who's on their first one and what makes it a good pick? Yeah, more than what route is, I think the skill development and um, that before you head out on a route or having that in mind um, is, 
topo maps. Do you know how to read a topo map? Because without some of this foundational stuff, like every route's going to really suck, or you're going to you're going to hate it and want to get off. So um, just. Yeah, I wrote, actually, I pulled, I wrote an article a few years ago and, and talked to Snorkel and Mags and Swami and a few other um, route hikers and creators for tips and Justin Lichtner. And they had some really great suggestions um, about how to get the skills that you need so you're not hating every minute of it. But um, yeah, work on the skills you need to be able to hike a route. A lot of that depends on, you know, creating realistic expectations for yourself, like the Hey Duke Trail, not a trail to route, Oregon Desert Trail, not a trail to route, but you have to carry a lot of water and being okay with that. And you might have to carry <laughs> a lot of food or spend time caching and being okay with that and understanding whatever route you choose to do, do a lot of research, read some blogs, talk to other hikers, um, and get a realistic, really the, all of the nitty gritty, the bad, the good, the ugly before you go out there. So I don't know what a good starter route would be, but I do what I've done on the Oregon Desert Trail is um, have a skills rating for every section. So every section of the 25 sections has <coughs> water availability, skills rating, navigation, and terrain. So terrain, you know, we have a section that's along Abert Rim, which is one of the largest fault block mountains in the in the country. And you're just walking the edge of this this rim, which is 2,500 feet above the valley. So it's not hard navigationally, but there's so much jagged lava rock. It's a nightmare. You have to go very slow. You'll twist an ankle. So for terrain, it's, you know, like a double black diamond. So mm -hmm. I've done the, the ski ratings. So it's it's helpful to think of, you know, what are the challenges? Because they're not always the same. So it might be really easy navigation, but there's no water for 40 miles. Or there's water everywhere, but it's a really, really steep climb and descent. I guess, selfishly, I don't love the desert. I'm a ginger. Um, In I case just, you didn't notice. Yeah, <laughs> if, you, if you weren't able to pick up on that, um, I, I don't do well in hot environments. I also don't like very steep things. Um, someone like me what would be like a nice mellow route in terms of not being desert but also not being climbing over peaks where if you fall it's bad right um well i definitely haven't hiked all the routes out there as much as i would like to and so I, most any. of my experience are the desert ones so i'm afraid i I don't have a clear answer for you excellent <laughs> i'll stay on my trails <laughs> i'll stay where i belong yeah so you mentioned doing your research going into one of these routes and this is a question that's maybe only applicable to a very small number of people yourself included what does the research look like for the person that's the first person to hike one of these trails as you did right um it's really going with an open mind and being willing to change so when i hiked the blue mountains trail i did the bulk of it in october so i also had the additional challenge of weather but I brought I think I had a six liter capacity of water because I didn't know there's a lot of blue lines on the map but are those sources flowing and there was zero information out there um, it's going knowing you're gonna have to adapt it may take you much longer to hike through or you might get through quicker having all the tools you need so I had you know all the rain gear I had a five degree catabatic quilt I had like the freestanding tent in case I had to sleep on frozen ground or rock it's just having all the tools I actually carried two phones and two battery packs mm. and paper maps so if one phone broke or I lost my paper maps or so I had redundancies so that I could figure it out if something went wrong. And I also had, because I was helping out this organization, like they were my back, my support. So I also had an in-reach. So there were like a bunch of people in the area where if I needed to, I could reach out to for help because a lot of these areas are pretty remote as well. Hmm. But knowing that someone could be an hour or two drive if shit were to hit the fan was reassuring. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I just sort of, I like it when it's unknown. And so you have to figure it out. You have to make good decisions. That's sort of a refrain. I love to tell people who are setting out is just make good decisions. And I think that applies, you know, to 
the PCT this year, the Sierra, you could consider that a route because the trail is gone. Mm -hmm. the, the trail in the, on the PCT in 2006 was all under snow. There was no trail. So you still have to use those same skills of which pass am I supposed to go up? And I could follow those footprints, but that person may not know which pass they're going up either. So, um, yeah. I guess talking about I could follow those footprints, what are some common mistakes you see people making when they're starting to route find? Hmm. Well, mistakes I made following footprints. <laughs> I speak from uh, experience. Um, and, and spacing out, like I love, I mean, part of the reason I love trails is just because you can let your mind wander. You don't have to pay attention. And if you are not like critically paying attention to your maps, especially where is the next water source. So I've missed water sources before because I've just been like, oh, I'm on this road and I'm thinking wonderful thoughts and not paying attention to, oh, I was supposed to turn that a mile ago and pay attention to water three miles ago. So missing water and following the wrong footprints have been a couple of mistakes I've made. And I guess maybe this might be a very similar question, but your top advice for someone doing route finding is to make good decisions. Can we break that down a little bit? Like what would be the characteristic of a fork in the road where somebody could make potentially the wrong decision? Let's pretend they have a little bit of backpacking, that they've done some of the AT, some more of the classic like through hiking style backpacking. What words of caution would you like to offer them in terms of like, if they got to one of these situations where they're not sure what to do, what should that um, flow chart look like? Um, so I really like this phrase that Swami uses is nature doesn't have a copy of your itinerary. Hmm. So it's sort of weather is a big one. And so if you're starting to hike into an exposed section and you see there's this massive storm coming, like, don't go. <laughs> you know, there's this section on the Oregon Desert Trail and I, I was actually hiking it in early November and there was a massive storm where it was, you know, howling winds, might have blown me off, um, rime ice forming on these signs. It's like, don't go. If it's if nature is not going to, you know, work with you, it's okay to stop and maybe have a snack, set up your tent, like just take a beat, <laughs> pause, and be okay turning around. So I mentioned this trail I hiked this spring, this route. I turned around because I, I was in this position where I wasn't going as fast as I thought. I was going to have to ration my food. But also, it was uh, following game trails on a steep section, um, really cliff, cliff sections above the John Day River. And the route creator, this, um, Scott, he, loved, he has done it over and over and knew the lines to take. And it was taking me so long to figure out which game trail and pick my way through. And then one wrong decision I made is like, oh, I should have been down here and not up there. I ended up trying to climb up, like pull myself up a little bit of scrambling with my full pack above a flooding river. And I sc scraped my leg and blood everywhere. And I'm like, you know what? I think this is a little more exposure than I'm comfortable with. I think I should come back with someone else. Hmm. Like maybe I shouldn't be here alone. So it's when, listen to your gut. Like my gut the day before is like, maybe this isn't the right time. And it wasn't, it wasn't until the next day where I had a three inch bloody gash in my leg. It was like, okay, <laughs> I think I need to pay attention to that feeling that yeah. I had that maybe now it's not the right time. Yeah, made the decision a little bit easier for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned when we we're doing the catch up on what you've done since the last appearance on the show that in 2021 you did the Corvallis to Sea Trail. Oh, yes, yes. Tell us about that. Yeah, so that was a new trail that just opened in 2021. And my good friend Amber um, had been helping with the trail. She's their, their sawyer. So she would go out and cut all the big trees. And so she was looking to hike it as well. And she lives in Corvallis. So we set out from her home. I love trails or routes where you can just walk out your front door or I don't mind hiking through towns or, or cities because it makes resupply easier, makes transportation easier. So we set off um, from her house and it goes through the coastal range and ends on um, 
on the Pacific coast and we walked into the ocean. Hmm. And so this is a trail that took a long time to develop. It goes through a lot of private logging lands. So there's active logging operations, which is something to be very careful with because you do not want to be this tiny little ant to this giant machinery that's out there. And so sometimes they have closures and it's not like one of those, you know, sometimes through hikers like to think, well, I'll just hike through anyway. It's like, no, you could get squashed. Mm -hmm. um, but then you're hiking next to these massive old growth trees. This is another, like Oregon has these amazing, beautiful, big trees. And so it's really, yeah, taking you through the coastal range. They actually have a bike alternate as well. So you can hike it or bike it. Um, so start and start at a coffee shop, get yourself a donut and walk to the, to the ocean. Unfortunately, there's no chowder shop, chow <laughs> clam chowder at the end. You have to like hitch up <laughs> to yeah. Newport. Um, but yeah, it's a short one. It's only 60 miles. So, um, in that one, I tend to do things in the off season. This was November and it rained a lot on us, a cold, cold rain. Um, but again, Amber and I were prepared but we still, it was an exercise in managing the wet. Like, how do you stay comfortable when you're cold and wet? And so that's another type of hiking. Not my favorite, but if you take what you need, you can you can do it and not, and not be a total suffer fest. Yeah. Can you just, f to dumb it down a little for me, can you tell me where it starts and where it ends? Because you said Oregon, but I read in Corvallis the Sea Trail, I think like the coast of Spain or something. Ah, uh, yes. So Corvallis, Oregon, um, it's in the Willamette Valley, not far from Eugene, which is, so Corvallis has the um, Oregon State University, Eugene has the University of Oregon. So big, and this is maybe an hour south of Portland. Mm, okay. So in the Willamette Valley, and then you hike over the coastal range and you end at Onas Park State Beach, or Ona State Beach Park, one of those word combinations, um, on the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, so not far from 101. It's a popular, like, beach picnicking area. Cool. Is this one on trail? Is this one of those trails that's a trail? Well, it's a trail that's a lot on roads. Okay. <laughs> So then this happens, like a lot of trails, even on the AT, there is a small section in Vermont. I was like, oh, this is a road. There are a lot of small sections of roads. So it's really interesting how we define that sometimes as a route, sometimes as a trail. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a real rule book out there for what, you know, but most of our long trails have a little bit of road sure. interspersed in them. Yeah. yeah. Is this one you'd recommend to the average listener? I'm going to even make it a little bit more personal because I'm looking for something in like the two to four day range for later this summer. And based on what you described, this sounds like this could be a good contender. Is this something that you'd recommend to it's, somebody, me? It's short and sweet. And um, yeah, it gives you a good glimpse into yeah, the coastal range. Um, what I love is how it could connect into the Coast Trail, Oregon Coast Trail. And so I look at the state of Oregon and now I'm um, on the involved with the Oregon Trails Coalition. And we just put out what's called our Signature Trails Report, which is has identified 15 trails in Oregon that we think are either wonderful experiences as is or could use some further investment to help them um, get established. And so I look at this map and I look at how they connect. And so you could hike the Corvallis to Sea Trail, hop on the Oregon Coast Trail. There's another trail that's really just in the planning stage, the Salmonberry Trail up by Portland. So you could hike mm. that. And then there's a, it, it's just this amazing network. Um, and so that's what gets me excited. Mm. Um, but yeah, for a short two, three, I think we took four days. Um, definitely worth checking out. We'll go even more selfish here. If I, if I was looking <laughs> specifically in Oregon and I just want the highlights, what would you recommend? Is there like a loop hike? I've been kind of eyeing maybe the uh, Three Sisters loop. Yes, yes. Well, and you're looking at the several day range? Yeah, like somewhere two to four days, we'll say 20-ish miles a day. Yeah, I think the Three Sisters loop is just iconic. And you've already done the Wonderland Trail, right? Or I mean the Timberline Trail. Did the Timberline yes. last year, yeah. Yes, so for, for views and smiles per mile, the Three Sisters loop is right up there. Hmm. Um, but something I've learned through the Signature Trails Report, there's long trails I've never even knew about. So there's one in the south called the Cascade Caves. It's like 80 miles. I'm like, what is that? I need mm -hmm. to go hike that. 
there's the North Umpqua Trail, so it's along the Umpqua River. Unfortunately, that's had a lot of fire damage. But there are a lot of, of ideas. There are a lot of things already existing. Um, and, you know, what was really fascinating, going back to the Blue Mountains Trail, the original vision for this trail, they had cataloged 2,000 miles of trail within the parameter of this one trail. So there's, like, it's infinite, hmm. the possibilities. Yeah. And talk about connecting. So with the Oregon Desert Trail, there's been, I think it's five people now who have connected the Oregon Desert Trail to the Pacific Crest Trail to the Pacific Northwest Trail to the Idaho Centennial Trail. Whoa. So there's a 2,600-mile loop called the Up North Loop. Ross and Kathy Vaughn hiked it. And I had already like looked at route connectors. It's about 100 miles to the Idaho Centennial Trail and 50 to the PCT on either side of the Oregon Desert Trail. And they were thinking the same thing. They said, could we do this? I'm like, well, I have some ideas if you want to ground truth it. Um, yeah, and other people have been doing it too. So, Ground truth, is that the person that breaks ground and does it for the first time? Right. It's, you know, you go from an idea on the map. I love using CalTOPO to sort of trace things out and, and put ideas down. And then you're what's actually on the ground. Mm -hmm. So you're ground truthing uh, your idea. Is it's a good trail name. Yeah. Oh, Ground it is. Truth. Ground truth. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Carries authority. Yeah. Is there a name for this conglomerate of trails? The Up North Loop. Up North Up North Loop. Correct. Interesting. Yes. Would you ever consider that? That's a lot of hiking. Um, I think yes. Well, I so since I've already I want to hike new trails, and I say that having just gone back to the AT. But the Pacific Northwest Trail is high on my list. The Idaho Centennial Trail is high on my list. I think I would do those in their entirety because each of them, you're not doing the entirety of the trail to do the up north loop. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, maybe. Yeah. I'm not I'm not putting anything uh, out of question. Yeah. So. Uh, zigging back to <clears throat> an earlier conversation, and sorry to derail us here, but if somebody wanted to start their own trail, obviously this is best done with a team. What, if you could build the ideal structure for let's say like a two or three person team to build a new trail, what hats are they wearing? Well, a lot of the work goes in before you ever break down. It's the planning stage, the working with the land managers, where would it go on the ground and the environmental analysis. So the agencies have to do something called a NEPA analysis and look at, you know, are there cultural resources here? Are there environmental like plants, sensitive plants or animals? They have to look at the entire context in the area um, and that could take years. So the first step would probably be look at a map. What's your, I, what's your dream? And then work with the agency and if they decide to take it on, because they have to invest a significant amount of time and energy. Um, and then once you do that, then you have to, you know, flag it, walk it, like where is this trail gonna go in, a, in the most sustainable way possible? And so the big issue you're looking at is water. So how is water gonna flow? Um, is it gonna erode? Are you gonna, is it gonna be massive amount of trail work every year? because you decided to build your trail on this riparian area that floods all the time. So you want to find an alignment, but you also, that has, that's sustainable, but it has, you know, views, has the real rewards for the hiker. And that's where you think about the hiking experience. Like how would a hiker like to travel? What is the path of least resistance? What is going to be rewarding? What is the grade or the slope? Um, so that's a lot of technical work, and there are lots of companies around the, the country and the world that do that type of like planning, laying it out, and then you get to the construction part, and you may have like a youth core that actually gets out there with hand tools, or you could have you know a small bulldozer or trail tool. There's uh, this whole genre of of small dirt movers and and mechanical assistance to build some of these trails, um, then you can do that when it's not in a wilderness area. So there is a ton of groundwork to do before a hiker ever gets there. But the piece that I'm really interested in and what I want to trying to focus on in my new consulting business is the next step. So you have a trail. 
how is the hiking experience? How are the maps? How is the guidebook? How is the preparation? How are you talking about it? How, what kind of expectations are you laying out there for your, for your hikers so that when they get out there, they know how to plan, how many miles a day, how many miles between resupply, water issues, where do you camp, where's the transportation? So that's the aspect that I really wanna um, help improve because I don't know if y'all have hiked many national recreation trails, but I went onto the database of national recreation trails. We have over a thousand mm -hmm. in, the, in the country. Um, but when you drill down, some of those are just a few miles. So I've been going through and sort of looking at them like, okay, this might be the list of trails I wanna work on. There's only about 230 of those that are over 60 miles. So I'm looking at long distance trails, something where you can spend a couple days at a time. And so of those, a bunch of them are water trails, which I'm a paddler as well. I love to pack raft and, and raft. So I see rivers as trails too. So a lot of the paddle trails that are out there, you're gonna have some of the same issues, like where can you camp? Where's the access point? Where can you resupply? So there's really like the, a lot of trails in the United States, but they don't necessarily have, tr not all of them have trail organizations that manage them. And so in my work on the Oregon Desert Trail, we overlap with a national recreation trail called the Fremont National Recreation Trail. And this was a passion project of someone that worked at the Forest Service. Um, I was able to meet him, but he had already been retired. But um, he got this 135 mile trail built, designated as a national recreation trail. But unfortunately, like, staffing, money, the agency hasn't had a lot of um, resources to maintain it. Um, but what I found is the line's not even accurate on the map because it was created before really GPS. So there's so much, I think so much to do to bring these, these trails that don't have a designated trail organization to steward it up to the standards where someone could just say, okay, I wanna go hike the Fremont National Recreation Trail. Boom, here's the maps. Here's the everything you need to know, because right now you just have to figure you have to ground. It's almost like ground truthing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't quite know what the water sources are like, or maybe it's not been maintained. And there's yeah, a, I'm trying to figure out how many of those national recreation trails need some love. And I'd love and I want to be that <laughs> that yeah. person to help them. This is probably an impossible question to answer. Um, sorry in advance. <laughs> Is there like an estimate you could make, like, and we're not looking for total accuracy here, but roughly for how long from start to finish it would take to make a trail based on the mileage? Like a five mile trail from start to finish versus a 50 mile trail versus a 100 mile trail versus a thousand mile trail. Is there a way to kind of guess based on the length and based on all these steps, how long it could take? I don't think so. I couldn't give you an idea because another part of the equation, which I didn't mention, is is public land <laughs> or private land. So sometimes, you know, the PCT and the AT and even the CDT, they change every year. The tra there's never a moment when the trail is like done and you can walk away. So there's there's private land that there's an easement so hikers can pass through. But maybe there's a new landowner that's like, no, nah, I don't. I don't think so. And so you have to plan a way around. Are we going to build a new trail? Are we going to, how are we going to reroute? Um, and so creating relationships with the private landowners, I think takes, can take a lot of time. There's another trail in Oregon called the Gorge Town to Trails, which has this loop idea in the Columbia Gorge. So you can hike, you know, through the Columbia Gorge, but there's a lot of towns and a lot of private land. So it's just taking a lot of time to create those, form those relationships, um, get those easements or have a land conservancy, maybe purchase the land. So it's, and I don't think there's any, there's, it's hard from one trail to the other. There are so many different issues. I could not answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> Go back to your previous, previous answer what is a national recreation trail? Yes, it's a, so there is a designation process. Um, so we have our national scenic trails. Mm -hmm. The national scenic trails and the national recreation trails are managed by the National Park Service. 
Um, and so the National uh, Recreation Trails are, there's a list of things that you need to do, uh, have done. Um, is, is the wayfinding adequate? Is, uh, do you have all the permission from the landowners and the agencies? There's, ba there's a checklist and it's like, great, you've done a really good job. You've done your homework. This is a good quality trail. Whereas the National Scenic Trails, that's an act of Congress to get those designated. So it's easier to get a National Recreation Trail designated if you've done all your homework and you've gone through all the steps. And there's a nice, clear, there are a lot of resources for like, what does it take to plan, design, and build a trail? Um, and they sort of outline that really well. Yeah, and then you get, so what that gets you is inclusion on a map and not like the federal maps of, of trails. And so you can get on, you know, something you can put on your walls, like, okay, there's this national recreation trail. Um, but like I said, a lot of them are pretty short. So they might be um, in local communities. There's a lot of emphasis lately on connecting communities to, you know, uh, opportunities that people in towns and cities can get on. And then maybe they're small little sections, but that's something that the community can really get behind. And there's been so much um, research done on the health benefits of recreation and hiking. And the recreation economy is like billions of dollars that recreation economy contributes. So I think on so many levels, people want more trails and sometimes they're short little trails and that's great too yeah it's not about the size um <laughs> <laughs> telling yourself that <laughs> it's about the motion okay uh so you've mentioned the consulting a few times now let us know give us the full umbrella of what your consulting services offer because you've talked about a couple of different avenues already well really i think at the heart of it long distance hiking can change the world <laughs> Just, you know, not a, not a small goal. But I think at the heart of it is the time we spend out there on the trails and nature helps us understand that we're a part of nature. We're not separate from it. And so I wanted to, I want more people to hike. I want more people to find that connection. And I think if more people feel like they're a part of it, then maybe we'll make different decisions and how you know, how things are managed or what you'll advocate for. Um, and so through that, I want deeper engagement with the natural world. I'm trying to bring um, conservation awareness, environmental awareness to the trails. So the Oregon Desert Trail and the Blue Mountains Trail were specifically created to engage hikers in those issues. But there are all of these trails we've been talking about, they have regional environmental issues happening there you know whether it's a pipeline going in or it's this loss of biodiversity or this tree that's dying for a certain reason and i think we as hikers when we're spending so much time out there i i want to learn about some of these i'd love to read maybe it's about the geology or the cultural history or the flora and the fauna and i think if we have if people are spending weeks and months of their life out there why don't we provide them more content, more engagement opportunities to learn about these issues? So I wanna help trail organizations embed more environmental conservation information into the trail materials so they can learn and be advocates if they want to be through when they're hiking or after they're hiking. So as part of this, launch in my consulting company this year, I developed a, a survey that I encourage hikers to take. So I've had not quite 300 people take it. Um, and the results are pretty fascinating. So far, 98% said, yes, they are interested in environmental issues that are happening to the trails. Hmm. And when I asked, I actually could grab my notes. I have some really fascinating um, results. But it's as simple as asking me, like, how could you get engaged? It's like, if the trail organization asks me, hmm. that's so simple. And then would you wanna learn about it, about these issues before you hike, while you're hiking or after? And they're like, yes, all of it. And then, so I'm really trying to, and I'm understanding, okay, hikers, I, I didn't wanna assume that what I want is what everyone wants. So that's kind of the purpose of the survey is, 
I want more engagement. Do other people want more engagement? And what I'm learning is, is yes, we do. And so I want to take this information to trail organizations, say, okay, can I help you embed that information into mm. the trail materials? And so that might look like a specific trail in Colorado, you know, what uh, working with maybe local trail or uh, local environmental organizations and understanding, maybe do an audit or an inventory. Okay, this regional trail, what are the issues here? Because a lot of these trail organizations are also volunteer. Like mm -hmm. maybe they have paid staff, maybe not. Maybe they're all a volunteer board. And so their ability to spend time and make these partnerships and these connections might be limited. So if I can play that in-between role of like really understanding, and then because I'm a hiker, um, I, and I think I have a pipeline into what hikers want, um, help all of us you know, help create the materials that we want. And in the process, hey, if there's if this guidebook's out of date, if these maps are out of date, I'm a graph designer, I make maps, I can write. Like I want to improve the trail experience from all angles. Conservation information is one, but just in general, like how can we make the trail experience better? So the consulting is primarily you to these uh, nonprofit organizations that oversee the trails. So you're not working with hikers directly or that is an arm of the service? Well, that is a new development. So I have like this folder in my, um, on my computer. It's like, I call it back pocket ideas. So, cause I've just, it's really new. I'm like, well, what's gonna stick? What are people gonna come wanting? And I've had enough hikers wanting you know like can you help me trip plan because the name of my business is long distance trail consulting so people it seems like people want some of that um, from the hiker side and I've even thought maybe it's looking like holding sessions or workshops or something where I help hikers understand like what does that mean to become more active in advocacy what actions would that look like you know maybe writing a letter to your senator or attending a, a town hall um, or it's just sure i can help you plan a hike so i am in the process of expanding if hikers want help i'm willing to help them and so and actually i'm here today in denver going to the big gear show mm. which is the outdoor industry and so the companies that make the gear that we use to hike and this is something I've been peripherally engaged in in a long time. Um, when I hiked the Continental Divide Trail, I was their um, first trail ambassador. And we worked with a lot of companies like Oboes and Big Agnes and different brands who wanted to support the trail and some of the conservation work that's happening. And so you create these partnerships with companies who want to give back and want to support nonprofits. So I'm like, okay, when I'm talking to these companies today, I'm like, this is something I also have experience in. So now I'm just trying to do it all. But my real interest is, yeah, the trail organization mm -hmm. and helping trail organizations. But at this point in time, I see so much opportunity. It's hard to say no when, uh, yeah, I'm so excited by it all. Sure. So how do you bridge that gap between <clears throat> informing the organizations on how they can be a better service to the hikers who want to be involved on a conservation standpoint? Like, what are the practical things that the organizations can recommend to hikers? You mentioned writing a senator as one example. What are the other practical steps? I know obviously like trail work, trail maintenance is a big thing, but for people who don't live near these trails, like what, what is this actually gonna look like in action? Right, so I can speak from on the Oregon Desert Trail because that's an area we've been involved in. Um, so one of the actions, there is legislation to protect more wild and scenic rivers in Oregon. And so we were, sort of doing an analysis and I realized there are 51 waterways that are on or near the Oregon Desert Trail that are unprotected. And so I reached out to the hikers that have been on the Oregon Desert Trail and I said, you know, 
do you would you want to nominate a specific river or waterway here's the list maybe you have an interesting experience or a funny tale because a lot of times to make something memorable and impactful to a legislator it's the story it's the personal experience mm. so if someone has you know oh i almost got swept away down the Owyhee when i was crossing but that's a really unique thing and i think that deserves protection random example but um yeah so i asked folks to nominate rivers and so some of them did and then and then that's you know the legislative process i'm not totally um 100 educated in policy and all that but it's kind of a long a long progression of activities so then maybe you you write a nomination so our senator wyden was asking for nominations and then he might hold a town hall so if you want to go to this meeting and say speak up and say senator i was on the shewakin river and i was fishing for this endemic red band trout and just you tell a story again making it as personal as you can mm. and that goes for writing letters and then it might be let's write him a postcard and say you know reinforce the message so that's just one topic area but we have another um Lake Abert, I mentioned Abert Rim earlier. You're walking along the rim of this large fall block mountain. Abert Lake down below is one of the only, the largest saline lakes in the Great Basin. So south, southeastern Oregon is considered the Great Basin. And there's thousands of, sh of birds. It's on the Pacific Flyway that rely on that lake to stop, eat. There's like brine shrimp in it, um, but it's drying up. And so there's different issues like, well, why is it drying up? And what happens if it dries up to all those birds? And so a lot of it's just coming down to education and giving hikers an opportunity to learn like what's happening on the Ebert Lake. And I see that from down below. It's this amazing lake. Um, but what are some next steps? And so that's where working with a conservation organization who has the concrete steps. So the Oregon Natural Desert Association has specific people work on any, on these issues. And so another trail, I think you go farther if you partner. I think a lot about it is connecting and having relationships and partners with, you know, those local people that are doing the work, doing the research, talking to the legislators to really understand like what's gonna help move the needle. Hmm. Cause it might look totally different, but I think in the end, writing, taking pictures, being willing to, like stand up in a town hall and Instagram, you know, sharing on Instagram. Sometimes organizations make it super easy to just sign your name to this pre-filled letter, but maybe write like a few sentences about why it's important to you. Those go a long way. Um, so really, but really tying into those, excuse me, local experts mm -hmm. to give you the, the nitty gritty of like, what do you need yeah. from us? I think that's a, a brilliant idea. I know I can speak for myself prior to the AT 2011 drink. Um, you know, I think I appreciated nature, but I wasn't in love with it the way that I was by the end of the AT or even a section of the way into the AT. I think that's true for most long distance backpackers I've come in touch with as they grow a deeper appreciation for the backcountry over the course of doing these things. And it sounds like you just want to tap into that and build the communication between the organizations and that affinity for the areas that they're walking through. Exactly. One of the questions I ask in my survey is why? Why do you hike? And, you know, there's to see a new part of the world, there's to challenge myself. But one of the biggest responses is to connect with nature. So of the 300 or so people, a majority of them hike to form, to have that connection, to remember that connection, to develop that connection. And, you know, the things that they're concerned about, climate change, forest fires. I mean, the PCT is a totally different trail than when I hiked it in 2006. And we're not going to solve the problem of forest fires, but I mean, it affects everything. And I'll be honest, one of the reasons I went back to the AT last year, sure, it was my 20 years, but I was pretty sure I wasn't going to have to deal with fire mm. if I went back the to the East Coast. The irony of what's happening right now out <laughs> east. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, New York's got like the worst air quality in the world right now. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I very much understand that. I was thinking about moving out of Colorado for a period of time just because we had like three summers in a row of it just being a smoke hellscape out here. Um, can I 
pitch an idea for you to implement into your service. Please do. I think one thing that'd be really cool is some sort of a newsletter that curated a lot of these national conservation issues. And it seems like you have your finger on the pulse. And I'm sure anybody listening to this that just wanted to be more in the know about these things, it'd be really valuable. And maybe this already exists, so perhaps it's redundant already. But like somebody that could just curate some of these bigger issues and just provide links out to the full story and just um, give us kind of like the bite size knowledge portion of it. Yeah, I think you're right. There are people doing that, but it's not necessarily targeted at the long distance hiker, Mm. you know, so right now you kind of have to do a little bit of your own homework. Um, But yeah, great idea. Yeah. Um, We're not wrapping here, but since we're on the subject, let people know where to go to fill out the survey. Yeah, so my website is longdistancetrailconsulting.com and there's a section that says hiker survey. And so, yeah, anyone, I'd love your ideas and I have some open-ended, like what would you do to improve the hiking experience? And a lot of the responses that are coming in revolve around leave no trace. Mm. Like there's too much poop on the trails. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I was and inclusivity, like make sure everyone feels welcome and that everyone has access to trails. So that is a predominant theme that is coming out, which is, you know, I think there's a lot of work being done around it, but obviously there needs to be more work mm-hmm. done in, being done on it. And I'd love like wild, crazy ideas and then some practical ideas. So help me help you <laughs> is what I want to do. <laughs> How do you decide how to narrow down your focus? Because that's a lot to cover for just one person consulting. Um, th- this is something you know we run into all the time is we get a fire hose of ideas and suggestions and it's tough to know when to implement them. If we get something on repeat, that's usually a pretty good uh, light bulb moment for us. But we get a lot of good suggestions that we just can't execute on because limited bandwidth. I imagine that you're in that position. Yes. Even driving over here, you know, listening to podcasts and I kept having to like write notes or take voice memos. I have like, I have hundreds of ideas a day. And yeah, I think uh, that is a challenge is to narrow it down. But sort of the vision I have is to have a lot of con- subcontractors. So I hope when the when I have more work than I can do myself to have, you know, if you're a long distance hiker, the better. And we can do this together and we can, you know, amplify by having a network of people who are skilled at different aspects of this work. And maybe that looks like I'm the air traffic controller at some point. Um, but I'll go with, you know, what I'm most interested in is helping the hikers be successful. And that to me is making sure the resources we're using are adequate. And something else I ask in the survey is like, do you carry paper? Like, how do you navigate paper maps, digital apps, follow someone, follow trail markers? Turns out people want all of it. Hmm. So it's not just enough to be on far out. There are so many people who want paper because they they like seeing the greater area that they're hiking through. They want to know their outs if something happens. What if their phone breaks? That happened to me on the CDT. My phone broke. You know, people want all of the resources. Mm-hmm. So I want to help create all the resources. Do people fill out the survey anonymously? You can, yeah. And so you can enter your email address if you want, if I can follow up and ask you more. But you don't have, you can be totally anonymous yeah. as well. I'm just wondering because I could see a lot of people if their names are tied if their name is tied to it saying that they want to use maps when they're navigating, but when push comes to shove, they're just on far out the entire time. Uh, I know, like obviously, the true backcountry aficionados want the map, they want the topo, they want to feel the region. But just based on my perception of how long distance backpackers behave nowadays, it's a lot of far out staring. I I I agree. And I used that on the AT. I had, you know, all the things and I definitely use the app more. But I think too, I'm, you know, the age range, so how old are you? I'm having people from their teens to in their eighties answering. Mm. And so again, it's like to make these trails accessible and uh, open to all, I think you need to have all of the resources um, so that everyone from, you know, the, the high schooler taking a summer off to hike the AT to, you know, Nimber Well Nomad going out for his last, last, last hike of the AT. <laughs> <laughs> right. I know another offering on your website is uh, you had mentioned previously doing logo design. 
Yes. Uh, and you're a prominent artist. You've done, your own logo is amazing. You've done purple rain skirts. Yep. Uh, why don't you just tell us, because I'm going to get it wrong at some point, and I don't want to sound stupid. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm offering, if anyone fills out the survey this summer, I think until the end of August, I will pick one person to get a custom logo. So I will make a logo, maybe your trail name, maybe you have a blog or an Instagram account or YouTube channel. Maybe you're have a silly trail name or a serious trail name. So you please fill out the survey and I'll pick someone to win a custom logo. That's my giveaway, my incentive to enter and fill out. Give me all your ideas. Yeah. If you want the full history of Renee's art background, we go in pretty good depth if memory serves on the last podcast back in the hiker trash days. Right, right. Yeah. How does it feel to not be on, because that was a big chapter of your life. Do you miss that element of it? Well, I, I love design and I and, as, and particularly logos and trying to capture the feeling and the, yeah, just what distilling an idea or a business or something down into a visual representation. But I feel like I'm getting that in this work, especially, so I've been creating trail logos lately. So I designed the Blue Mountains trail logo. Mm. I designed the logo for Dirtmonger's Great Basin Trail in Nevada and this a new water trail, the Tualatin River Trail. So um, I'm getting that creative outlet and and I think helping you create your logo, whoever <laughs> you are out there, would be fun too and yeah. kind of scratch that itch. I'm trying to find the Blue Mountain Trail website to see the logo. I want to see it's this for myself. Hellscanyon.org or just Google Blue Mountains Trail. It's a bighorn sheep. It's not. Or it's no, on my website. Um, and go to, there's probably, there's a page for the Blue Mountains Trail on the menu. Mm. Oh, here it is. Hell yeah. Love that. Oh, that is cool. Yeah. And so that has already been tattooed on a body. I think the idea. <laughs> that's that's you when you know you've made it. Right? Yes. So it's like hiker, the hiker, several of my hiker trash designs were tattooed on people's bodies. And now a couple of my logos have been tattoos. It's like, yes, that's, that means I did it. Yeah. <laughs> Are you able to disclose other companies you've done logos for? Um, Anish. I designed Heather Anderson's yeah. logo. Um, let's see. All good. Whitney LaRufa, I designed his logo a few years ago. Um, I have, so something else I'm offering a summer hiker special is, again, if you don't win the logo, you can hire me to create your logo. And so I've just been putting a page together with a lot of examples of some of the logos I've done. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very cool. Um, this is a request from our show coordinator do you want to take this question yeah rachel um this is funny rachel was obsessed with the fact that you do gis um because she also does gis and we told her you are more than welcome to sit in on this and she said ironically she cannot because she has a meeting with their local gis professional association <laughs> um but just so that when she goes back and listens to this she satisfies that itch can you tell us about the dabbling you've done in GIS and also what that is? Yes, I will say dabbling is the right word. Um, so it's geographic information systems. So this is sort of the the database behind mapping. And there's a lot of analysis that goes on. So you collect all this information from a, from a survey, maybe not my survey, but things that you can visually represent on a map. And so I love maps and I'm a graphic designer, but so many of the maps are created through like ArcGIS, which is a platform, CalTOPO is a platform. So I've been teaching myself how to make maps in ArcGIS. And so I've done a lot of it when I worked at the Oregon Natural Desert Association and was creating, you know, maps for projects that volunteers were going out and doing. But it's, it's you know, a field of study I could spend years and years and years on. I'm kind of been teaching myself and that, uh, real, the aspect that I really enjoy doing are creating story maps. So this is uh, using maps as a basis to tell a story. It could be any story. It could be the trek and all the hikes that you've done together and all the, you know, it could be 
Um, so I did a, a story map for the signature trails report, which I mentioned, and that's diving into each trail where it is. And so you can zoom into the trail, you can give photos, videos, audio. And so it's really mu a multimedia experience to help explain visually, uh, auditorially just really make an idea come to life mm. and so that's a way to make maps more I don't know interesting yeah. maybe to some is there an example of this on your website uh, yeah yeah so I did a map for the if you go under the let's see the about probably mm -hmm. um, the greater heart Sheldon region this is a story map I made for this area between the Heart Mountain National Antelope Refuge and the Sheldon Antelope Refuge. And so these were two areas that were protected for pronghorn antelope. And turns out the area in between these two refuges is very important because pronghorn don't pay attention to boundaries. And so this area between these two wildlife ref refuges is critical for the pronghorn migration. And so this story map I created to help illustrate why this area needs protection. I'm having trouble digging okay. it up, but we'll include it in the show notes. Email okay. me afterward yes, and yes. when we're done recording, show me because I want to see it because it sounds very interesting. Um, I think we've hit on everything that I have outlined that I wanted to chat about. Do you have any other questions? No, I think we covered An it all. Another impromptu fuck, Mary kill. I, no, I, I'm I'm satisfied. Okay. I don't know what else she could fuck, Mary and kill. <laughs> There's um, plenty of things out there. <laughs> There's plenty of things, but <laughs> on topic. Yeah. Any parting messages you want to leave with the listeners of Backpacker Radio? Um, be curious. Make good decisions. Uh, put the puzzle pieces together. Like I, you know, create your own. Walk out your front door. Maybe you can create your own route to your favorite trail. It's like anything's a route. Snorkel. Liz Thomas is great at urban routes and trails. I I think, you know, expand your definition of what a hike is and, and just be curious. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great note to leave on. I think what you're doing is awesome. I think it's a, this is a really good mission that you're on and very happy to support it. Um, for people who want to get involved, again, the site is longdistancetrailconsulting.com. Lots of cool stuff on there. Renee, thank you so much for joining us again on Backpacker Radio. Thank you. Happy to be here. To the Trek propaganda portion of today's show, I want to do a fast and easy one. Um, as always, the title is indicative of what the post is. This is the top 10 ways to save money in town in the context of long distance backpacking, aka through hiking, by Eloise Robbins. Um, there's just one tip that I want to mention here, which was not obvious to me, which I really liked. And there are some things in this article, which I think if you've been researching through hiking are kind of like no brainer duh stuff. But one thing I thought was especially interesting was Eloise emphasizes to choose a cheap trail family. You are the average of the people closest to you. And if the people that you're hiking with are going into town and are going to the brewery for six hours and getting two meals and drinking, you know, 12 rounds of beers, that's a hard thing to say no to. If the group that you're hiking with is just dipping into town, getting a $3 shower at the hostel, getting your ramen and heading back to the trail, well, odds are you're more likely to save that money too. Uh, this is just me speaking my own thoughts, not reading the article as I usually do. But uh, yeah, if you're budget conscious and you're looking for ways to make your dollar go further on trail, highly recommend this piece. And we'll leave it at that one for now. I have a note here that you have a stupidest thing of the week. Yeah, I did this on my way in. Um, so I was smelly again. I, I thought of it when I was putting on my shirt today. And I was like, I should fix that before I sit in this room with no windows with you guys. Um, and forgot to until I parked. Uh, fortunately, I keep the deodorant stick in the car, that, that middle console deodorant stick. It's very important. Um, so I took it out, brought it in, it's in that bag and um, went to put it on before the episode. It was warm because the car is warm because it's warm outside um, and didn't really think about what that means for melting deodorant. So there's about an inch thick deodorant on each you know, each armpit. Um, <laughs> Just liquefied deodorant? Yeah, I mean, it was rolled up a little bit and it's like, it's 
this kind where i mean now you can see there's no tip yeah but it had a rounded top to it right. and the melted part um it's all it's all on my armpits the good news is you don't have to shower again for a month yeah and i i'm sure it would probably help with razor burn to have a thick uh moisturizing natural oil advanced care dove yeah stuck to my armpits there you go do you have any impromptu stupid thing of the week stupid thing of the week it can just be like a dumb thing where well, chance and i are dumb human beings mm. so we usually have ample content yes. for this segment uh i'm putting you on the spot if you've got something if you don't we can move on Oh man, yeah, La, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Doesn't surprise so I me. will defer you're, you're the much, dumbness. Yeah, you're much smarter I'm, than we are. No, 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 <laughs> I'm right up there with you, but brain not operating. Yeah, <laughs> I feel that game. Triple Crown, this is another Rachel special. Mm -hmm. This is the Triple Crown of ways that you're turning into your parents. Yes. Uh, I wish my brain was operating on six to eight cylinders right now because I could rally off a thousand of these because they, they increase every single day but I've, I've got three lined up that are just a little too obvious to ignore. Perfect. I've got four. Okay. I'll start because I don't want you to take mine. Um, my first one is the strong urge to have a vegetable garden. Mm, that's a good one. It is getting stronger by the year. Yeah. I need to, I need to grow a crop. And I need to. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're already down that trajectory with the fact that your house is a jungle. Yeah, but those aren't apartment. vegetables. It's very different. Yeah. A house plant and a vegetable, like, I need to grow something and eat it. Yeah. But you've already, I remember going back to pandemic times, you didn't trust your ability to grow house plants, and now look at you. I know. I, I, like I said, it's growing with the year. I'm, yeah. almost, I'm almost, if I were the vegetable, I'm almost ripe. Yeah. <laughs> I just need a yard and time. Your office looks like the Rainforest Cafe, minus the zoo animals. And those are my coworkers. Yeah. Uh, How do you go hiking though when you have a vegetable garden? See, that's I haven't figured that out yet. Yeah, um, we're domesticated animals now. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I'm a house cat. <laughs> My first entry is I'm apparently I'm on a dark theme right now, but uh, this is more so I'm in line with my dad as opposed to both my parents. But I just don't have time for friends. My dad, <laughs> my dad doesn't have a friend. <laughs> my dad's friends are my mom's friends' husbands. And uh, yeah, I don't like the little free time that I get. I usually will go for a hike or exercise. So uh, my friends are basically RIP to me right now. I hope this one will improve. I'm confident that it will. I'm in the throes right now, but um, yeah, I'm turning into my dad because I'm just excommunicating all my friends from my life. I'll give you one of mine, which is very similar to yours. So I'm not gonna end up using it, but I wrote down the desire to be unbothered and not leave the house. Sure. And I think that fits in line Just with yours. General <laughs> curmudgeon -y yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think the pandemic only amplified that because I'm right there with you. It's yeah. like, I don't need to go out. <laughs> yeah. Something starts at eight o'clock, no thank you. Yeah. I have one friend who, I mean, I've been friends with her since birth, so we know each other pretty well, but she keeps trying to, make, to get me to go to her house, which is like, a 20 minute drive for me. And I just flat out tell her, I'm like, look, nothing personal. It's just probably not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I'm, I can't think of a night where like, I don't have the podcast where I get off work, where that's something that I just have the energy for. Like I, I just, I'm not even going to give you the false hope of saying, okay, let's plan something. It's just probably not going to happen. You know what stinks is when I do actually make the time for it, which is less and less. I always feel awesome, rejuvenated. Like the, yeah. the science on this is very clear. We need communities to be at our optimal health, but it's just so easy to be like, nah. It's so <laughs> yeah, easy. I'm just watching Netflix. Yeah. Uh, Especially when you have like a pet. Like now that I have a dog. I have three of them. Oh. I might, those are kids. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, like I, t I could talk to Harper, you know? I'm not home alone, I'm my dog's there. <laughs> yeah, fair, totally fair. I know we sprung this one on you last minute. So uh, the format of the show is we do the top three of this category. Right. And we do a uh, snake draft. So chance me, you get two, and okay. it comes back to me. All right. So I was told recently my feet are starting to look like my mom's. Ooh. Ooh. So that was like a friend of hers. She's like, you're... It blew me away. She's like, your your feet are looking just like your mom's. Is this like a sexual I light? don't know what that actually means <laughs> and that they're getting wider and they're getting bunions and <laughs> ugly and gross. But Is this from a family member? Who knows no. both of your feet well enough a, to say Yeah, this family friend from a long time ago. Yeah. But yeah, I happen to take a lot of pictures of my feet. If you go onto my Instagram <laughs> account, you know, it's like the chocolate. Oh, you should be charging fan. for this, Renee. <laughs> yeah, I'm consulting you right now. Right. <laughs> Only fans. Yeah, right. right. Right, right. 
Um, wow. That's a great entry. That's yeah. honestly better than any of mine. Yeah. Yeah. But it is your turn again if you've got right, another one. Right, right. Drinking coffee all day. Mm. Damn, that is like one. my mom will, my folks will have coffee, a pot going all day, and I'm right there with them anymore. I can drink it all yeah. day. That's a really good one. Shit. I had three <laughs> cups of coffee and now I've got nicotine in my mouth just to try to get me, my brain activated. Okay. Uh, number two. This is, I like this one because it was like two years ago that I was making fun of my parents for just like how much they get joy out of this. And now I'm in 700 days. I'm right there with them shopping at Costco. Not, not only just making purchases at Costco, but like legitimately to the point where it's something that I look forward to. And it's such an unnecessary thing because a lot of the stuff that I buy will just sit in our pantry for three months, a year. If it's not a hot ticket item, it just collects dust. Like I got uh, two Leo Eats Cheerios as every toddler in the world does. I got two of like the mega boxes of Cheerios four months ago and one of the boxes is still unopened in the pantry. Um, so yeah, I'd say my affinity for Costco is uh, right in line with my folks. Very good. Um, this this one excited me when you requested this today, just because this is recent and I have like a funny clip to play with it. But my second one is, and this is kind of a recent one, um, like not wanting to watch violent movies or like movies that are tense or like just anything where it's going to cause me stress to watch it. Um, I remember what about like a Marvel movie. It depends. It depends on my mood. But, but the thing I thought of with the parents was we watched um, one of the Star Wars on Father's Day. It was the one with like young Anakin and Jar Jar Binks. Yeah. Came out on Father's Day. <clears throat> we went to go see it. My mom left in the middle of the movie. Like walked out of the Isn't that theater. Is regarded as like the worst of the Star Wars movies? I don't know. I just know she went to Barnes and Nobles and said it was too violent. <laughs> um, and so like I've been on this like I only want to watch wholesome things yeah. kick lately, and it's been driving Garrett up the wall with having to pick movies. So I recorded him. That he didn't know I was recording him, but this is him trying to get me to decide on a movie the other mm. night. It was fantastic. Hold on. Has he given consent? No, of course not. watch a happy movie with no plot where they just smile and tell each other they love each other in their little secret garden. And there's dogs. So he's folding laundry as he's saying this. <laughs> and one person tells the other person they love them. And the person says, I love you too. And then they kiss. <laughs> That's it. Can you put it on? <laughs> if, if, if this movie exists, I will find it. And then he's going through the Pixar movies. It's unbelievable. <laughs> this, this movie does not exist. I can go, I'll go through every single Pixar movie and you'll be like, no, too violent. <laughs> Luca, he's an orphan. That's too sad for you. Lightyear, they're in space and there's guns. Cars, the car breaks down. Nemo, they lose the kid. The good dinosaur, I know nothing about. Oh, I haven't like, seen that either. Don't feel like watching it. <laughs> Brave, she's got an arrow out. Ratatouille, oh no. The rat's oppressed. I don't want to watch it. It'll make me sad. Oh, soul. The parents don't want him to sing because we can't watch that. Monsters University, darn it. He's a nerd. He's treated poorly. I don't want to watch that because it's too sad. Toy Story 3, oh no. There's a mean toy. I don't action. like Toy Story 3. So this is like, this is what it's like to try to watch a movie with me now. So the two that we've watched, um, we watched Onward. That was great. Mm. Very wholesome. Is that Pixar? Yeah. Um, it had a lot of like bright colors in it. And then last night we watched Zootopia. Uh, Loved it. Yeah. Um, There's some dark elements in Zootopia. Yeah. At least too dark for Leo. I know that much. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I just am not in the mood for anything violent mm -hmm. right now. I don't know why. If you had to pick one movie that you were going to watch on repeat. So I watched, this is, um, we watched this this weekend. It was called, I wouldn't watch it on repeat, but we watched Loving Vincent, which is about Vincent Van Gogh. And it's like a mm -hmm. hundred different painters made paintings and the whole movie is just paintings um it's a documentary no it's a story like written through paintings so it's like a cartoon but instead of it being like a stop motion cartoon or like image after image that's graphic um or like computer generated it's painting after painting hmm. um it was really cool uh but i mean van gogh killed himself so it wasn't fully wholesome yeah 
I can kind of get on board with what you're saying. I've never been into horror movies for that reason. And I'm not like especially sensitive to that type of stuff. I think I tolerate it like the, a normal person. I just don't understand the urge to want to exp- like, if you've got finite time to consume entertainment, I don't know why you'd want someone getting like their eyeball stabbed when you could be watching a comedy or something educational or whatever it might be. See, I've always been on that trend, but even like lately, like I don't even want to watch like an action movie or anything with like any type of like stressful plot point. I don't I just like it makes me sad. Yeah. <laughs> I find the gratuitous violence like it's not just the eyeball being stabbed, but it's the visual and it's going in and the goo coming in there like focus on it and you have to look at the eyeball being stabbed yeah, for like a minute. Yeah. I don't want to see that. I've <laughs> never seen a lot of like never seen the Saw movies, but I can handle like a Blair Witch Project because it's not explicitly violent. The idea of it's spooky, idea of it, yeah. very spooky, but just like the the gore is just like mm, I don't need that. Yeah, I mean to tie it back, I just I I think of my mom standing in the living room going, oh, it's too violent, yeah. and like walking out of the room. Yeah. So that's my number two, um, and then my number three, which to choose, which to choose. Um, these are all kind of the same level. I might need to snag that deodorant from you. <laughs> you're I'm not putting. Myself. You're not putting my deodorant. It's gonna be a fair. hard no for me. Fair. That's fair. Sorry. I understand. I get it. I get it. Um, I love that you assumed I would have said yes. <laughs> well, I just for the sake of our guest. Yeah. I don't. I can't smell. I like you, and I'm not that much. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, going. This is something I haven't started doing until this year, and it's a benefit, but also very father-like. Um, going through every like every expense, every charge on my card, every statement, every every expense that goes through a digital form with a fine tooth comb. I called Amazon twice this week because they charged me four dollars and twenty nine cents for Prime Video. Apparently, someone was watching PBS History. Um, it wasn't me. So, I, like the amount of conversations. You should go back and get that because that's all the PBS documentaries, and they're awesome. That that's was the it. Best. You did yeah. you charge <laughs> this? <to me? laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I was. I called them last week, and I was like, I don't know this charge. Like, please remove it. And they were like, okay. And they still hadn't removed it. So today, I was like, what gives? Um, and the, I was just sitting there, like, am I the person that's now calling over four dollars and twenty nine cents? And my mind was like, well, it's the principle of it. Like Amazon nickel and diming me, like taking $4 when I didn't even push the, you know, purchase button. Like I spend enough with them. And I'm going through this thought process of who am I? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, that's 900 bucks over a couple of decades. So yeah. it adds up. Yeah, it sure does. Up. But you should, as the history buff that you are, you should go back and uncancel for all, it. I mean, for all I know, it could have been me. But I didn't buy it on May 29th. Okay. So that charge I didn't recognize. Very like me. Fair. Yeah, all the Ed Burns documentaries are on that. Maybe I bought it last year on May 29th, and it was, like, renewing because I had watched a lot of them. Anyway, I didn't recognize the charge. Mm -hmm. Uh, For my last one, again, this is just my dad, but uh, I get frustrated when other people load the dishwasher because they always do it incorrectly, and there's a couple of ways. There's a certain place for where the large plates go, there's a place for the small plates. There's a place for the bowls. The silverware should be pointing down and not up. And when anybody else gets involved, it gets fucked up and I get frustrated. So I'd rather just do it myself. Yeah, it sounds like a way to get pinned with dishwashing duty. It's fine. Because uh, I'm usually the one who empties the dishwasher or a task I'm happy to delegate, but it never works that way. Uh, but I would rather load it because I get frustrated doing the unloading. Yeah. Okay. Do I get a third? You, you do. do. Sudoku. So I was visiting my folks last year and I'm like, I've never really, what, how, why, how do you play Sudoku? And so my dad sat down and was like, okay. And now I'm like playing in every, I pull it up when I'm waiting, when I'm on the airplane. I'm like playing Sudoku all the time now. It's so addicting. Yeah. Have you gotten into Wordle at all? I haven't, but I know it's a slippery slope. Yeah. Going back to our parents, my mom got hooked on Wordle, and New York Times has like a whole slew of games that they offer. Spelling but, Bee. Spelling Bee, but I think Wordle's the only free one that they offer. No, Spelling Bee's free. Is it also we free? We play both in our afternoon meetings every okay. day. Yeah, but I'm hooked on Wordle. But it's become my ritual to do it while I'm pooping, so I call it turtle. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you. Uh, that, you could put that on the way you're becoming a parent. Well, I mean, I've always been that way, but um, yeah, fair enough. Um, honorable mentions. Yeah. Um, I've got, like, refusal to answer phone calls. Um, I've had two or three come in this week, not even from unknown numbers. I know the numbers, and I just let them ring, and I look at it. Is that I don't, something your parents do? 
my dad, I don't know how, like this is actually an accomplishment. I don't know how he's done this. And this has been like a years long thing since probably cell phones. Um, he's gotten Verizon to disable voicemails. You can't leave a voicemail on his phone. It's, mm. it's actually not an option. Is he his had them box just full. No, they, he does not have one. Mm. Um, and he also keeps his phone off at all times. And his methodology is if I want to call you, I'll turn it on and I'll call you. And if I don't want to really, call you, then my phone's off. Yeah, no, I've gotten significantly dumber. It's an inverse correlation between phone usage and my cognitive capacity. So, I like to read the transcription of what the voicemail says, and if it's like a like if it's someone who wouldn't leave a voicemail who's calling, they'll usually follow it up with a text if I don't answer. If it's like a friend circumstance, so I'll usually wait for the text to come, and if it doesn't come. I'll probably assume it wasn't important. Hmm. Um, and I'll like text back later when I have energy. But answering when you don't know what it's about is just yeah not on my radar. My mom is the exact opposite. She could be getting like open heart surgery and if she heard her phone ring, she'd be like, could you stop for a second? I need to <laughs> answer this spam phone call. So yeah, I don't have that one. My lone honorable mention, I think this is the most cliche parent thing of all time, but uh, I've fallen victim of this is when you're frustrated by one of your kids trying to rally off the correct name for that kid. Mm. You go through the full onslaught before you actually get to their name. Like my mom used to call me by my dog's name and I've actually caught myself. I haven't gotten there there yet, but I could feel the name entering into the rotation. Yeah, I've been called Charlie a lot. Yeah. Um, I've also got talking to myself. Like, especially when I'm doing something that's frustrating myself. Like if I'm like doing something wrong or I'm like challenged in some sort of way, just like, like talking it like out loud to myself about it as if I'm another person. Mm -hmm. Um, I started talking to myself a lot more out loud. Very good. I'm sure I've missed a billion obvious yeah. ones. I'm getting very dead. We can do a part two yeah, down the road. For sure. Um, I think we can skip all these other segments and go to mailbag. This is a big boy. Yes. Okay. I'll sit up in my chair. Hi, Zach and Chance. I am anti-Apple and use Spotify to listen, so I couldn't write there but wanted to show my gratitude for y'all and this podcast. So strap in. This is a two-parter. A little background. I'm also an Illinois boy. Would love to hear some talk about the Shawnee National Forest sometime. I've only done a backpacking-ish trip to the Boundary Waters when I was 14, carrying a 70-pound pack and a canoe through the portages. Currently planning a PCT thru-hike for 2024 thanks to this podcast. Other than that, it's normal adventuring, car, ugh, adventuring, car camping, day hiking, and water finding. Cool water features, not constantly searching for drinking water. I'm currently listening to episode 110, so I'm not sure what's currently going on in Backpacker Radio World. I've been listening nonstop since January, every moment I'm in the car. I stumbled upon this podcast when I was in the darkest place I've ever been in my life. I was chronically ill and then had been hit with COVID during that time as well. And that took me to a very dark place mentally and also affected me physically to the point where I couldn't work, could barely eat or function. I found this podcast. Listening to everyone's stories and adventures kept me intrigued and gave me something to look forward to. As I got further in and listened more, I realized this is what I needed. I needed a direction to focus on and a goal for myself. Listening to what other people were able to accomplish after going through what they did got me thinking, why can't I do this? And that's when I decided this was the direction I needed to go. This podcast has given me two goals. One, the PCT. Two, do something cool or far out enough to be on the show as a guest. Honestly, it just sounds like so much fun. So thank you to everyone involved in the show. This is the only podcast I've listened to, and it's been one of the best decisions I've made as far as impacting my life. Changed the whole trajectory for me. P.S. Poop story. I couldn't write in without one. Not trail related exactly. My brother and I were kayaking on our local river. We stopped to check out this split and islands when all of a sudden it hit. We were a couple hours paddle from either road bridge, so I was limited on options. This is also a particularly fl a particular flood prone area, so all natural materials were gone. I had dead grass, sand, rocks, and nothing to dig a hole with. At this point, I'm sweating. I began clawing at the dirt under the flooded sand to make my hole. With less than a second to spare, my hole was dug and I was relieved, in more than one way. Now squatting over this open hole relieved, I found myself facing my next problem the lack of materials. I'm frantically looking around to no success. I thought, okay, I could use my sock. It's wet, but I'll live. However, due to the consistency of the relief, I could not stand up without considerable drip and slosh. So I'm sitting there while squatting and realized I had one option. I had an old cotton t-shirt on. 
Needless to say, that shirt is now missing a sleeve. <laughs> now remember the consistency? The cotton sleeve, no matter how many folds, soaked through and was not very good with the cleanup. So while I didn't shit myself then, I was covered. I cleaned up and we continued on down the river, minus a sleeve and underwear. I didn't leave them, they were just destroyed and sitting in the back of the kayak. P.S. for SP, whatever that means for shameless plug. Oh, SP is shameless plug. Just wanted to give a shout out to Brooke Kansas underscore art on Instagram. I've never met a person who is more inspired by nature and an amazing artist. I had her draw a dog family portrait for my mother of our current dogs and deceased pupper, and it's incredible. People should follow her and ha- people should follow and have her art for them too. I'd provide a picture of the drawing, but I'm currently on my way to get lost and chase waterfalls in the Nanahala National Forest, so let me know if you want that. Infinity stars all the way. This is an email, so I can give as many stars as I want. There are no rules. Keep making great content. I drive a shit ton and would like to not run out of episodes. You guys are great. Literally life-changing. Blue chicken eggs taste the best. Midwest Woody, not a trail name, just my Instagram, trail name pending. Oh, and then we have an update from Midwest Woody one month later. I just wanted to give you guys a shout out again. For those keeping score, your podcast has now helped me twice. The episode with Second Chance Hiker, episode 111. I believe it was talking about all the mental health stuff that he went through and everything with the suicide hotline and how that just wasn't for like if you're on the brink of suicide. Bringing him on and going through all the stuff on the podcast really helped me this week in a time of need. I was driving to Denver and had a really bad breakdown and everything that he talked about in that podcast interview just stayed in my head. So again, thank you guys for bringing on meaningful people who are willing to discuss difficult topics. I know I'm not the only one who's been affected by some of the deeper conversations you guys have had on this podcast, but keep doing your thing and thank you again. Infinity stars all the way. That was nice. Yeah, that was an incredible email. Thank you so much. That's like the most flattering thing that mm-hmm. you can hear is that you've had that sort of an impact on anybody. Yeah. So I have trouble like Im- like embracing and accepting that sort of feedback because it like yeah when you hate yourself you can't take compliments. No, I just like it's hard. It's hard to think that like us sitting here babbling has yeah. that kind of an impact on no, people. I understand. I get it. Um, thank you very much for that email. That, yeah, that was very heart- heartfelt and uh, honestly, again, very flattered that we've had even a morsel of positive impact on Mm -hmm. your life. Also, there's something mentioned here uh, about pup art. I forgot exactly. Pup art. What what was the person that he commissioned to do Um, art? Brooke, Kansas. Yes. Uh, Not directly related to this person, although people should check this person out. We'll include the handle in the show notes. But for August's hiker meetup, we're going to be lumping in one of our guests to show up at the hiker meetup and do pup paintings. What? Yeah. So if I bring Harper, she's going to paint Harper? Yep. Fuck at, off. At 40 bucks. Oh, and the quality of the art. Steal. Yeah. I actually um, sent her a note on the side being like, you have to charge more than what you're charging because these are amazing. And you'll have a line of a thousand people if you don't up the price. Yeah. Tell her I want I want dibs. Yeah. I want the fast pass. No, we'll definitely make that happen. We get uh, all the priority. But <gasps> This yeah. is going to be great. I'm so, going to put Harper on my wall. Yep. Keep an eye out for the August meetup. Still in the works of planning it. We don't have any of the specifics to offer yet, but it'll be early August. And if you've got a pup that you want commemorated with art, definitely show up to this one. To the five-star review, giddy up. This is from T. Hazy. As a triple crowner from a different era. Here you go, Renee. <laughs> AT 2000, PCT 2003, CDT 2005. With its payphones, postcards, and handwritten journals, I really enjoy listening to you guys and your guests to get a sense of through hiking these days. While my life as a parent limits my big hiking to smaller trips, Teton Crest Trail last summer, it feeds my soul to hear stories of big adventures. Thank you. Walk away, Tommy Moses Hayes. You're welcome, and thank you. Also, good to hear from the quote-unquote old-timers. It's always interesting to hear what life was like on trail back then. Sticker code. Mm. Options. I liked the Ground Truth mm. trail name. Um, I don't know what they could incorporate that with. Just find a way to work it into your comment. Yeah, like use it in a sentence somehow. Yeah. So on the Instagram announcement post, do, are we doing Facebook too? Mm-hmm. Is this just okay? Uh, no, but I think for the for the sake of getting a sticker, go to Instagram. Okay. Because I could also I could just I could sit here and tell you do it on Facebook too. We're not gonna make Mara check both. Yeah. Um. So you could also do it on Facebook. It just probably won't get in the running. Yeah. But we don't sell these stickers. The only way you can get it is to uh, listen this deep into the show and use the sticker code in the Instagram comments. 
thank you to our Chuck Norris Award winners on Patreon. That is Alex and Misty with Navigators Crafting. Actually, should I go to the actual list? I'll just read this one. I sure. apologize if I miss anybody. Um, Rachel updates it at the start of every month. So okay. if you don't hear yourself or you do hear yourself and either is wrong, just know that it's like a monthly update we do for our own sanity. And email us so we can give you an extra shout out. Yeah. Alex and Misty with Navigators Crafting. Andrew, Austin McDaniel. Austin Ford, Brad and Blair from 13 Adventures, Brent Stenberg, Christopher Marshburn, Dane. Ish. Do Good Pantry, Greg McDaniel, Liz Seeger, Matt Sukup, Mike Poizel, Morgan Luke. I am your father. Patrick C. and Cialo, Sawyer Products, Timothy Hahn. Solo. And Tracy Trigger. Hans. You can follow us. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> really raspy. Yeah. All those cigarettes are paying off, finally. You can follow us at Backpacker Radio on Instagram and TikTok, at Backpacker Pod on Twitter, Facebook.com slash Backpacker Radio. You can follow Renee. At We Are Hiker Trash on Instagram, and that's it. Yeah. Good well, to simplify. Yeah. Chance? You can find my book, Hiking from Home, a long distance hiking guide for family and friends on Amazon, and you can find me at, oh shit, I said it backwards and now I confuse myself, um, on Instagram as Juliana underscore Chauncey. Appalachian Trials and Pacific Crest Trials. Subscribe and follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you consume podcasts. That's the best way to ensure you don't miss future shows. Follow us on YouTube. We're just churning out video content left and right. So yes, we are. We've been getting more feedback that people like to watch the podcast as opposed to listen to them. Wave to the internet, high internet. Um, but yeah, if you guys want to see what Backpacker Radio looks like, here we are. Oh, also, did you notice I moved this? I did. It looks great there. Yeah. I had to deconstruct some of the sound panels. I don't think the sound panels are even necessary anymore. I just keep them because of the aesthetic. We've, yeah. We've got like real microphones now that makes those obsolete. But uh, shit, I'm blanking on the guy who made that. We'll get it in the show notes, though. Yeah, it's it's uh, pretty cool. But it's fucking awesome. I, yeah. I felt bad having that off frame because it's it's too nice. No, oh, yeah, it is great. Yeah. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much for listening and happy hiking. Bye.